Hello and welcome to this edition of Living with Heart. This is a live one that we're doing tonight where, where usually we record it and air it later. Um, we are tonight offering a, a live attended event and we're so happy to have you all here and for those who are going to be watching it after, welcome. My name is Jennifer Corey and I am the founder and chief hope facilitator of the Heart Initiative. And I am so delighted to introduce you to Dr. Stacy Rose this evening. Dr. Rose is the uh, director of the Rose Relationship Learning Center in Ocean Township, New Jersey. She's a psychotherapist with 25 years experience and her specialty is in relationships and in trauma. And in addition to all of that, I've had the privilege of knowing Dr. Rose for even more than those 25 years before mm -hmm. either of us became professional psychotherapists. We were friends and we continue to be friends and colleagues today. And I'm just so happy to have her here so that we can talk about how to activate resilience for what we're calling the long run. Um, we're in the midst of this pandemic called uh, COVID-19. And uh, Dr. Rose and I, Stacy and I earlier this month did a video at the very start of this to talk to people about how to be able to navigate this sort of tremendous wave of fear that arose for everybody, especially in the first days and the first two weeks or so into this. Well, now we're in a solid month into it and we can clearly see that we have a, a bit of a ways to go. Exactly how long that is, we don't know, but we know for sure that this is not ending tomorrow. We have at least a couple of weeks and perhaps longer ahead of us. And one of the things that Dr. Rose and I have found and among our colleagues, we have a really um, rich group of connected um, support and fellowship among our, our psychotherapist group is how a lot of people are moving into what we're calling this phase of kind of weariness. Mm -hmm. So we've been doing this now for a while and some of that initial fear has begun to subside, but it has begun to turn into something else, this kind of ongoing weariness. And we wanted to offer you what some of the best tips and strategies are that not only are we using in our practice, but that many of our colleagues have shared with us that they are using as well. Um, and then we'd be happy to field any questions that anybody has. But let's get started first with um, introducing Dr. Stacy Rose. Hi, Stacey. Hi, thank you so much, Jennifer, for having me here. It is an honor and a privilege to uh, be alongside you personally and professionally. Uh, like Jennifer said, she and I go back a very long time personally and professionally. And um, it's just, it's a pleasure. So thank you for uh, having me be a part of this. Um, like Jennifer said, I am uh, a psychotherapist. Um, I have a PhD in educational psychology. I have a master's degree in clinical social work and have been in private practice for 25 plus years. And a lot of the work that I do is with people of all stages of relationships. So um, single people who are just beginning a relationship. I do a lot of premarital work. I do a lot of marital work and couples work, um, heterosexual and homosexual couples and however people identify. And then I also would do a lot of work with people who are on the brink of divorce and helping them navigate through um, a, a amicable or as amicable a, a, a separation and divorce as possible, a graceful divorce, if you will. And then I do you know, a lot of work post-divorce so, you know, relationships are challenging in and of themselves pre-coronavirus. And what I've seen, and Jennifer too, is that take, you know, all the issues that we've had uh, in relationships and then put them on steroids, exaggerate them. And people are really, um, many people are struggling. Many people are thriving, by the way, too. And we'll talk about both tonight. Uh, but uh, again, it is, it's an honor to be here. So. So one of the things I've heard you say over time, Stacey, about the work you do with divorcing couples, which is so interesting, because you think by the time people get to the place that they're getting divorced, they're certainly not going to counseling, right? Mm -hmm. But it's actually very often, it's a really critical time for people to go into counseling because um, I've heard you call it family-centered divorce. So the couple may be changing their dynamic, but the family itself must remain connected and engaged and intact for the lifetime of those children and grandchildren and why that kind of amicable or civility in divorce is so critically important. So I've always admired yeah. that part of the work that you do. I like holding dynamite a little bit, but I, I can appreciate Thank you. how incredibly important it is. Thank you. You know, it's an interesting thing that, that it's been said that many people get married for the wrong reasons and stay married for the wrong reasons. 
And also too, many people uh, think that staying married for the sake of the kids is the way to go. And what research actually shows, there's a lot of research on, on the statistics of divorce and how it impacts children, is that it's not divorce in and of itself that, hurt, that hurts kids so much as how parents divorce that can hurt or not hurt children. So, um, you know, it, it's definitely, uh, it, it reminds me of looking at where our power is, kind of like with this whole pandemic. There's so much that we have no control over. And if we can hone in on what we do have control over, it's refreshing. It gives us a sense of uh, control and power. And ah, like I, I have some choices here versus all this chaos is around me and I'm completely out of, out of control. The same thing is true with divorce. We, we might not be able to control the fact that the marriage is over for whatever the reason, but it's the how we navigate through something. That's where our power lies. And so that brings us to what we're doing here this evening. And that is, um, well, first of all, I, let me introduce Buddha. He was the, uh, the, the third uh, block that we were seeing, the third base as we were starting. Buddha works um, with me on the Heart Initiative. Um, Buddha is, does all of our, our technical work and really helping with the direction of our business, especially you know, in terms of, of how we navigate that. Um, technologically. And he's here helping us sort of run this this evening. Um, so Buddha, I just wanted to introduce you to and I want to welcome everybody who's here watching as well. I know some people I think are showing up and, and maybe others are not, but we, we're welcoming you all. I'm happy to see everybody who's here on this, uh, this call this evening. So um, Stacy, why don't we talk a little bit about what you and I are seeing as psychotherapists a month into this, you know, we could talk a little bit about normalizing the emotions and the experience that people have in the beginning. You know, I usually start talking about the mammalian brain and how we go into that fight or flight mode. But mm -hmm. the truth of the matter is, is that most people aren't really in that place at this moment. There's a different kind of anxiety that's emerging. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and so we're, we're seeing a wide range of how people are reacting to this. I wonder if you'd talk a little bit about what you've seen and what our colleagues have talked about. Um, sure, sure. It's my pleasure. So uh, initially, I think many of us were in this acute stage of panic and anxiety, which is completely no normal and understandable. Our lives as we knew them before Corona, if you will, um, have been completely turned upside down. Mm -hmm. That what we knew was going to happen the next day and the next day and the next day, it, our lives look nothing like they looked before. And how people navigate through these profound changes um, can really determine a lot about how they feel. So that acute stage, it seems like, at least from the clients that I'm working with, and I, I imagine the same for you, Jen, um, it's no longer the shock um, that initial phase of shock, if you will, it's more of, oh gosh, like this growing weariness, as you said earlier, that like, how long is this going to last? And kind of holding on, like, okay, is it April 30th? Is it May 1st? Is it, is it May 30th? How long can I hang in there? And what I keep helping my clients to do is to come back to here and now. How are you doing right now? What is your life? What does your day look like today? and really staying focused on, again, what we have control over. Um, what have you seen, Jen, in terms of some of your clients? So it's interesting. Um, some of the people who were extremely anxious in the beginning and felt really, really frightened and, and like there was no solid earth on which to stand have a, 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 a adjusted maybe to the new normal. You know, they've sort of acclimated a bit to the new normal. And people who felt uh, a bit more, I don't know if I would say nonchalant about it, but let's just say might be holding the fear at, at bay. Mm -hmm. um, now that we're sort of into it, a month into it, a lot of those people are feeling more of the anxiety of, of just as you said, wait a minute, how long is this going to go on? I thought I just had to hold my breath for three minutes. It's going to be six or 10, you know, exactly. and so some of that panic is starting to set in. And I think it's you know, for, for people who felt calmer in the beginning and less so now, that can feel a little disturbing. And so some of it is just wanting to offer the normalization of it. Like, mm -hmm. okay, wait a second. First of all, none of us have ever done any of this before. None of mm -hmm. us. 
And um, there are no unacceptable feelings. There are just responses and reactions that are more or less helpful. But fear is fear and uncertainty is uncertainty. And one of the things that really helps to anchor the brain is having a sense of what to expect. You know, while while we don't love uh, routine in that it can become mundane and boring, the truth of the matter is, is that it also provides a sense of security. And we like adventure. We just like adventure on our terms. (laughs) <laughs> I'll go on vacation, you know, I, whatever, I walk to work instead of taking the bus today, or, you know, I climbed that hill, but we like it on our terms. When it's imposed on us, then mm-hmm. it, that novelty can feel really frightening in some way, especially when we don't know what the end point is. So a lot of this has been helping to both uh, validate, normalize the feelings, but I want to say that, and then I want to say how critically important it is to be able to know what emotions are actually helpful here and which ones are harmful, meaning which ones empower and which ones disempower. Yes. To remember that we can make a choice, not a choice over what we initially feel, but a choice over what we feed. Mm -hmm. And whichever, what do they say? Whichever dog we feed is the one that's going to grow the most, right? And so uh, if we're feeding a lot of fear by reading, maybe overexposing ourselves to the news or spending a lot of time on social media, especially where there's a lot of catastrophizing, um, then that's really going to fill that sense, you know, overwhelm that sense of being out of control. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things, Jen, that you and I have said many times is that we liken this, um, this whole pandemic and quarantine time to uh, going from a sprint to a marathon. Mm -hmm. And that when somebody is running a a short sprint, there are certain um, skills that they need to, because you know, it's short lived. I can go from here to there. You know, how many times have people said things like, well, I can do anything for five minutes or I can do anything for one minute because we know it's short lived. But if we know like, oh gosh, now it's not just a short, like uh, 800 meter thing. It's 26.2 miles and maybe longer, maybe it's an ultra marathon. We don't know. It's the, the challenge of being able to pace ourselves and, and really you know, pull from the reserves of tools that we already have in our toolbox. And then when we don't know what to do and we're kind of fresh out of hope, we're fresh out of tools, that's when we reach out. We do webinars like this. We reach out to colleagues, um, friends, and, and tap into other people's resources. And every Monday morning, Stacy and I may, meet with a group of psychotherapists. And really what we do, it's like a, I don't know, it's like a card exchange. Remember when you're kids and you trade baseball cards on the corner? <laughs> and what we're there is we're talking about our best skills and tools. Which things are we using that seem to be the most helpful and beneficial, not only to our clients, but to ourselves as well? Because we're, we're seeing things change kind of rapidly over time. And what we want to do is make sure we are collectively pooling our, our skills and our, our experience so that we can offer the best help possible. So that's really what I wanted to do here tonight, Stace. I thought, what if we could offer people yes. um, a couple of what we've seen to be best tips and strategies, and even our personal strategies mm-hmm. as well? So would you say mm-hmm. a little bit about what some of the best practices are that you've offered your clients, or maybe your clients have come back and told you, or we've Absolutely. talked about it? Or- I would love to. So um, these tools, I think that as we present them, are meant as options, you know, right. as if you were to go to a buffet, you don't have to eat everything at the buffet, but there are options. And when I say that, I don't want people to become overwhelmed by the, all the options. And I think that that can be easy for, for that to happen very easily because it's like, well, do I want this? Do I want this? Do I want this? And how much of everything? So there are so many options and I think we have to be mindful, like what's going to feel best for me right now? That's the question. Do I need a break? Do I need to go for a walk and be in nature? Do I need to listen to music? Do I need to move my body? Um, But one of the best things that I found personally and professionally for for clients, I I spoke with a client today uh, virtually, and she showed me a painting that she's doing. She's doing a self-portrait. She's not had the time to paint really before. And now she's got all this time and willingness to paint. and, And it's beautiful. And she said, it is one of the only times, this is somebody who struggles with major anxiety pre-corona. Um, she said that when she is painting, she is not thinking about anything else other, other than where to stroke next and where to put the brush and which pastel to choose, etc. 
So you're talking uh, about fully immersed in the moment. She's completely in flow, completely in, in flow. Um, and for me, I don't know if anybody can see, I have a, a keyboard behind me. I sing and I play a little keyboard. And for me, when I'm engaged in music, I'm not thinking about how many people have died from the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to think about that. It's sad and I recognize it, but I don't want to live in that space. So um, I think finding a balance of information and then creativity. So one of the tips I want to offer is, you just made me think about it when you said about, I, I don't think about how many people have died. It's sad, but, but I, you know, I'm allowed to have time out from that. Yes. One of the, my favorite practices is teaching people that it's okay to hold the sadness and hold joy all in the same place. A lot of times we really get caught in this either or, either I'm grieving the sadness over what's happening in the world, or I'm enjoying some time at home to be able to do some gardening or, or attend to my life in some other way, you know? And what I wanna do is teach people that it's okay to create a space to experience both of those things. Mm -hmm. That you can, you can, uh, Victor Frankl referred to it as the tragic optimism. I mm -hmm. love those two words put together because they seem so paradoxical, but then you bring them together and it's like, that's right. We can recognize the tragic, right? Mm -hmm. But we can also recognize the beauty. Yes. Isn't it wonderful? I'm, I'll never forget after 9-11, that fall to me seemed like the most beautiful fall I had ever seen in my life. The sky was bluer than I ever remember it being. Now, I'm sure some of it is that I was awakened to the sky in a way in the days and weeks that followed that I wasn't normally attuned, but it was truly the most beautiful fall I, I ever remember. Mm -hmm. and, and to know that we have the capacity to hold all of that in our heart simultaneously and how important that balance is, that in the midst of the struggle, there is also the beauty and that we can tap into that. Yes gifts with pain, that they, they accompany each other. And if people are, you know, again, like you're saying, which, which brain do you want to feed? You know, do we want to focus our energy on the pain or do we want to look at the beauty? And I'm not saying to dismiss e either of them, but to, to, to kind of hold them in the same space. And Stacey, um, can you use that ahead. term about, about being the guard at the door? Can you say that one? Yeah, so um, actually it was Jim Rohn, if, if um, your viewers uh, are familiar. He's, he's since passed. He was kind of before his time, but there are many um, isms that he has left behind and they're beautiful. So he, one of his isms was that we need to stand guard at the door of our mind. In other words, to choose what we allow in and, and or to say no thank you to what we want to keep out. No, I'm not letting that in. Uh, because you've spoken a lot, Jen, about the negativity bias in the brain and our, our brains, you know, just typically naturally go to what's not working or the fear or the negative versus looking at what's beautiful. I mean, I, I, everybody I, you know, who's working now from home, I'm sitting in a home office that wasn't, it didn't exist prior to this. And I look out at these windows and I notice birds and the colors of birds that I never noticed before and how beautiful they are. So that's the blue, where I want to focus. Behind, the blue and the behind yeah, you. look how pretty. I mean, Gorgeous. so like cool. right. So there's just um, it, it all exists. The negative doesn't erase the positive, nor does the positive erase the negative. It all exists. Um, Lucy Hone, who is a, a writer um, and a, a an expert in resilience, who is from New Zealand, she wrote a book called Resilient Grief, mm. and she wrote it after the loss of her own daughter. So. Imagine being the, the, the expert in that part of the world on resilience, Australia, New Zealand, and then losing your daughter and, and at 13 years old and sort of having to put your, your life's work to real test at that moment. Not that she hadn't before, but never, never in that capacity. And she came up with a question. Sometimes it is the most simple questions that are the most sobering to us in the moment. And she said, when she found that there were, um, there were uh, moments in the day where the grief was just overwhelming and she would suddenly find herself like sitting there in this pool of grief, like pouring over pictures or whatever. She would just stop and ask herself, she'd have like this one moment of clarity and she'd say, well, is this helping? She said, sometimes, yes, I just needed to purge, but like an hour into it, is this helping? 
Now imagine that moment. That's the moment where you're sort of standing on the bank observing, right? Standing out of the river for just a second and looking back down and saying, well, well, wait a second, is this actually helping? And if it is, go for it. But if it's not, then to ask this next most critical question, well, what would help? Would baking right now help? Would taking a nap, would, would going for a walk, would getting into a cold shower, what would actually help right now? Mm-hmm. Now, it's so ridiculously simple, but it is so powerful when we are in the middle of like the undertow. Sure. You know, well, is all of this kicking and stuff, is this helping? Well, what would help? It's like, a mind shift, right? Yeah. It's, it's just this shifting where you put the focus. You know, sometimes I'll talk about if you were to take a flashlight um, I have a, what I think is a lovely office, my other office, and you know, I'll sit with clients in my office and I'll say, if you were to take a flashlight and bring it into my office and just put it in the corner over there by the molding on the floor, you might say, ooh, your office is pretty dirty, you know? <laughs> but if you look at the whole picture, it's like, where do you want to shine the light? You know, so do we want to shine the light on, you know, the corner that I forgot to dust or on the beauty that exists everywhere? Uh, let's do maybe one more tip each, something we think is really very, very important. And then we'll see if there are any questions. Buddha is here to help field some questions that come into the chat box. So, Sure, sure. If you have any questions, anybody, you can type them into the chat box at the bottom of the page. That would be great. One of the things that I have found is um, changing our physical state. If we are sitting a lot during the day, um, get up and move. If you find that you are on the couch binge watching Netflix after Netflix after Netflix, kudos to you. That's okay. There's a lot of great Netflix out there. Um, Having said that, I think it's really important that we get up, whether it's in between each episode, get up and not just to go to the refrigerator and get food and go back to the couch, but to change your state. If you get up in between episodes and you do 10 jumping jacks and then you sit back down on the couch, you will be better for it physically and mentally. Um, so I think it's really important that we are getting up and we are moving our bodies mm-hmm. as yeah. often as possible. Uh, I agree. I, I definitely agree. That idea of we can, we can change our state by changing the physicality of what, what's happening, what we're doing, I think is so important. The, and the movement as well as, like, here's the other side of it. How's your sleep going? Mm-hmm. You know, I've had a lot of people tell me that, well, since I don't have to get up at a certain time in the morning, I find I'm staying up later and later, going to bed at two and waking up at you know, 11. And I don't know if this is true. I should do some research on this, but my mother, so it must be true. My mother used to say, Mm -hmm. um, anything after 12 doesn't count. Like she would say, you know, the hours before 12 are the real sleeping hours. Now I see Buddha looking around. He's trying to figure that out because Buddha and I are both night owls. But I will say this, when I go to bed at 10 or 11, I definitely feel more refreshed than when I go to bed at two. Um, But I would say no matter what time you go to bed, that eight hours of sleep is incredibly important. It's very important to our brain. That is what's called the rest and restore period. And when we are under any kind of ongoing stress or distress, and I used to joke and say, that's life, you know, we, AKA life, but mm-hmm. AKA life in a pandemic for sure. We need, that is not optional, that rest and restore period. And I don't know, I mean, Einstein said he could go on four hours. Um, I, I, all of the research that we have on sleep tells us that that rest and restore period is critically important. And there are things that are happening during that circadian cycle of sleep that require us to have that eight hours, or they say somewhere between seven and nine. So split the difference, right? Because there are cycles of REM sleep and there are these alpha and beta states that we go into that are just critically important. And when we, when we shortcut ourselves with that, well, we know that people who sleep less tend to be more obese and have greater health issues and die at a younger age. And there's all sorts of implications that we know, but we also know that that we don't have the same kind of restore, the the same kind of psychological and physical restoring that we we get when we have enough sleep. So Mm -hmm. I think along with sleep is make sure that you have a routine. So uh, part of what helps to keep us anchored or grounded. And part of what helps to keep us um, uh, emotionally feeling stabilized is if we know what to expect each day. And there's nothing like this pandemic to, to have just sort of taken all of that sense of routine, unless you're somebody who's still working from home, in which case you're still making your own hours, probably more or less. And so the idea of saying, 
this is what time I get up each morning. Mm -hmm. and, and I highly recommend that the night before or the day before you have that routine written down. So you're not getting up in the morning and trying to figure it out then. Mm -hmm. There are times, even during really difficult times in my life, if I, without thinking about it and certainly without wanting to do it, get out of bed, make my bed and get into the shower, everything is different from that point forward. Because it's like I've already started the routine. Do you remember, Stace, who's that admiral from the Navy who does the, the TED Talk, who talks about, do you know why we have our soldiers make their beds and make them so perfectly first thing in the morning? Do you think we care about how they make beds? Mm -hmm. What we care about is that from the very first decision you can make, the first sense of autonomy, the first moment in which you can make a, your own choice, you make a choice to do something that is disciplined. Mm -hmm. and you have made a choice for how you are going to approach the rest of the entire day. It sets the tone. It sets the tone. It sets the tone for the day. And I think, you know, with behavior, so with sleep um, and with movement, the balance of the two and routine, then there's no reason why we can't be thriving really during this chaotic and uh, uncertain time. There's no reason why we can't. Did, we heard somebody use a term this morning, Stace. I don't remember it, but it was something like um, Corona pressure, you know, where, where, right. Somebody said that part of what can happen is all, people can feel so pressured to make something good happen out of this time that they feel like they can do nothing. You know, it's like, well, then I should just stay in bed and watch Netflix because mm -hmm. I don't have the energy for that. And I think that well, I love thriving and that it's a wonderful thing to aspire to. The truth is this doesn't require greatness, this moment in time. Mm -hmm. What it requires is our willingness to participate, to, to be active, to move in some way in our own best interest in the moment. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that Stacey and I have offered is um, do, doing for others acts of service is an antidote to depression. And depression is one of those things that can kind of creep up on us as over time, we develop a sense of feeling helpless or hopeless in the face of a set of circumstances. Mm -hmm. And we can see how that could happen here, right? Where anxiety and depression become like the little uh, ping pong, you know, match going back and forth. One of the best things that we can do, so we've already talked about for the anxiety, emotion regulation, choosing where to focus the flashlight, making sure that you're moving, setting up routines. I want to say that for depression, one of the most important things you can do is to think beyond yourself how can I be of service to others? But I say that and I say, you do not have to throw yourself on the sword. Now, this does not mean to become of service to everyone under every circumstance so that you can be exhausted. It means to do it in an appropriate and measured way, to maybe each day say, what's one thing I can do to be of service to another person, as opposed to you know, 20 hours a day. It's a beautiful thing, I think, because um, it gets us out of ourselves and and it helps somebody else and in helping somebody else we feel better ourselves so it's a win-win mm -hmm. uh, i've recommended that clients look at their contact list in their phone mm -hmm. and literally reach out to a different person every day that you haven't spoke to a text a phone call email um, thinking of you how are you doing with all this it can be so profoundly helpful both ways um, the uh, pressure that you were talking about you're referring to i think they're calling it like a motivation, motivational pressure. Like if uh, there's, there are things bouncing around all over social media that say things like, if you don't have a side hustle and like three businesses, by the time this, this, you know, uh, quarantine lifts, there's something wrong with you. It's not that you didn't have enough time. Yeah. I mean, it's this, it's the shaming that, you know, that's going along with it. And that's, I agree with you, Jen, that th that's not what this is about. It's not about being the best you can be right now. I think it's about living each day very intentionally very consciously, moment to moment. Like, how are you in this moment? And what do you need in this moment? You don't have to come up with, you know, three, you know, uh, new businesses by the time this is all over. Right. Um, is it an opportunity to be more creative and to think outside the box? Sure. And I would highly recommend that people do, but not with that kind of pressure. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing that I saw, interestingly enough, in regards to couples, uh, one of the things I was reading is that, um, they're calling it, uh, what are they calling it? Coronials, um, which is this new generation of new couples that are um, couples that maybe just started dating prior to the coronavirus hitting and how that's impacted their relationship. Has it kind of sped things up? Do we want to quarantine together? Are we quarantining at your place or my place? 
Um, and, uh, and is that, you know, it will be interesting to see how that manifests over time. Um, and then there are certainly the couples that, you know, were on the brink of divorce prior to the coronavirus and how being quarantined with their soon to be ex spouse is really profoundly challenging. And, and then there are the, the group of people that are um, in domestic violence situations that are quarantined at home with their abuser. And it's important that those people know that there's help and there are resources out there. So, you know, go ahead. You, since you're the relationship expert here, would you give one or two tips for how to um, maybe care for your relationship during this time of, you know, I mean, we, we are spending more time together as families and couples than probably in the last 50 years, at least in the, you know, in the Eastern, uh, uh, in the yes. Western world. It's so true. So what I'm recommending to couples is, is a few things. Um, almost regardless of where, what stage your relationship is in, I'm recommending that there's, as best you can, a balance of together time and mm -hmm. alone time. And if you decide that you're going to meet with your spouse in the kitchen for lunch, um, then let that be the time that you meet. And then you go off to your respective corners and whether you're both working from home or whatever it is, or one's with the kids while the other's working, vice versa, uh, that there's a balance of alone time because I think that we may be craving more alone time than ever before uh, because we don't have it. Mm -hmm. You're not getting in your car, driving to work, or taking you know, the train into the city, or you know, you're um, with your spouse or significant other 24 seven. And then if you have children and if you're homeschooling the kids now too, that's another, another added level of um, challenge. Yeah. So I really think that the, the best thing you can do is to carve out time. I don't care if it's 10 minutes every day where you're meditating, uh, taking an extra 10 minutes in the shower, going for a run, um, putting headphones in so you can block out all the sound in your house. Yeah. But really like giving yourself that gift of alone time just to check in with you. I love that. Yeah, I think that that's, that is really great. Um, one of the things that I've been suggesting to people is about here's an opportunity to make some space in your home, your sanctuary. Mm. We've, I'm, so often we, we've been accustomed to running out for our peace somewhere. I go to the park or I go for a walk and all of those things are great unless your park happens to be closed. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to Starbucks for my coffee or I'm going to meet a girlfriend or something. And so we're, we're I call it, you know, the, uh, the human timeout. We're, we're in this timeout or time in, I guess, right? Mm -hmm. And so we can kind of push back against that or maybe even go into a place of apathy. The, the, the thing about TV is not that it in and of itself is negative, but if it's the only thing we do to give our brain time out, then we're, we're missing not only a great opportunity, but it has a way to kind of atrophy the brain because it's such a passive process. If instead, or, or yeah, in addition yeah. to, we can create a little sanctuary somewhere. I mean, an altar is such an easy thing to create. And by altar, I mean anything that reminds you of the sacredness of, of this space for yourself. So it could be a candle and a little plant or a couple of stones from outside that are piled on top of each other or some meaningful pictures or whatever, but that you allow yourself to have some space in your own personal space that when you step into it, it's the reminder to really drop into yourself and to remember about sort of the sacredness of your own breath, your own life of this moment. Remember, even in the midst of all of this, mm -hmm. um, what, what are the things that are going right? What are, or at least what are the things that are not going wrong? Mm -hmm. Right? Right. And, right. Uh, and the other thing I like to recommend is the all, the all walk, A-W-E. Mm. That every day you allow yourself to literally seek out awe in your immediate surroundings. So either right outside your window or out on a walk or within your own home, but to allow yourself to be awed by something. Mm, that's beautiful. I love that. I love that. Thank you. So um, thank you so much, Stacey, for all this. So I know that Buddha's been asking a couple of questions. So Buddha, if you don't mind, can you just field those questions for us um, and let Stacey and I answer a few questions? And um, I'm just going to mute. Um, right. So I've got a couple of questions. One is around social media. 
So usually social media tends to be a challenge for most people because you see other people doing things. Um, before this, it used to be travel photographs and things that you do. And now, even though with social distancing and no travels, it's kind of gone the other way where people are still posting about the fun activities that you're doing online. And that has also brought a level of pressure around it that are you not engaging enough with people that you should be still engaging because mm. technology exists. So what suggestion, recommendation, tips would you give uh, to people to better manage this still? Because uh, it's just, I mean, social media pressure has always existed, but this has kind of shifted in a different direction. Mm -hmm. So what can yeah. we do to essentially- That's a Great question. So Stacey- It is a great question. Yeah, I would definitely like to respond to that. So um, to your point, Buddha, social media pressure has always existed. And um, I, I say that, the, that any kind of comparison is the death of happiness. And that whenever, and, and social media is a breeding ground for a comparison. Oh my gosh, look at these people. My life is not like theirs. They look so happy and I'm sitting at home miserable. Well, maybe your viewers have all heard this expression. Don't compare their outsides to your insides because it's not a fair comparison. You don't know that after they post their awesome picture of like how they made the Easter bunny baskets with toilet paper in them or whatever they did this weekend, um, that they didn't get off the social media and have a major fight with their spouse saying, you know, I, I'm thinking like about the divorce. Like you toilet paper. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> you know, they had a fight about the toilet paper, right? <laughs> Why'd you have to give it to the kids for Easter? Um, but the point being that we don't have all the facts mm -hmm. So we're taking a tidbit of facts and then comparing it to everything we know about ourselves. It's a completely unfair comparison. So I would say, just as Jen and I often say, be mindful of how much news you take in, be mindful of how much social media you take into. And don't believe everything you see or read or hear. We have to remember to be discerning. Just because it's, it exists online doesn't make it so. Mm -hmm. um, and I love what you said, Stace. I agree with you completely. I've been telling clients that for years. I remind myself of it all the time. So social comparison is the death of happiness. No question, if ends or outs about it. Uh, we know all the research about it tells us that people who tend to use social comparison most often use it to the negative, which is seeing themselves as one down. Um, and, and even, by the way, when people use social comparison as a, as a one up, um, it means that's sort of that definition of uh, situational or circumstantial self-esteem, which means I'm only as good as my last post or whatever, my last happy activity or something. So we or know the that. Of it gets. Or what, say Buddha? Or the number of likes it gets. Basically. Oh, exactly. Yes. Likes. That's right. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. so, so that social comparison is uh, wrought or fraught rather with, with the, the seeds for a lot of emotional and, um, and social pain. Mm -hmm. I think it's if I were to extend the question as well, I think with social media, if I were to look at personally, um, I'm not that much into comparing, com comparisons, but it can also work as an information channel, not from news, but almost to figure out if I do get bored, these are potential options that are available to me. Mm -hmm. So would that be a better way of looking at it? Can, can, can people see that as, as a different way of digesting the information that they're seeing? Absolutely, Buddha. Um, so like I said, the word before intention, mm -hmm. if people can, and uh, you know, and I would, I'm talking to myself as well. I need to be mindful of this too. You know, it's very easy when we have some downtime to just get on Facebook or Instagram or whatever, and just start scrolling without really a goal in mind. And so I, I would like to throw out the idea to everybody, like I said myself too, to think, okay, I'm gonna to choose to go on Instagram right now for five minutes with the goal that I need some help with fill in the blank. I need some help with, I don't know, what kind of recipes I wanna make, what do I wanna make for dinner tonight? Cause there's some great recipes on Instagram. Um, I need some help with meditation. Like so many people talk about this meditating thing, but I don't, I don't even know the first thing about it. I'm going to, you know, just follow people about, you know, who's a great meditator. Um, so well, if people should be mindful use, of that. Yeah. Potential use instead of just mindlessly scrolling. Exactly. Yeah. Because we were talking before about that negativity bias, that mindless scrolling, if you're not really in a, 
in a really good, good place in that moment can easily start to become this, this fodder for your own misery. Absolutely. Uh -huh. You see how happy they are and poor me. Yeah. Poor me. And sometimes, by the way, we want to go to that poor me place. Um, but be careful of the self-fulfilling prophecies, you know. Um, well, I like what you said, like, you know, can we use it as inspiration? Of course. It's all, as you said, stays the intention. Yes. You know? But if, if it inspires us, that's a good thing. Remember what Lucy Hone said, I referred to it before. Is this helping? Is mm -hmm. this helping? And if not, what would? Because sometimes we pick up that phone or we go to social media just to fill in an empty space in our life. And so one must ask the question, is this helping? Mm -hmm. So Buddha, it's like 16 minutes after, we probably have time for one or two other questions. Um, one question that comes up is around concerns for family and friends. So this is a particularly challenging times for people who don't stay with family or don't have an option to stay with family and they are far apart especially i mean i can obviously test, test to that uh, my family lives quite far apart um, and you can get quite i wouldn't say anxious but you do get concerned like you you want to make sure that their well-being is taken care of because you don't really have control over any of that mm -hmm. so how would you approach that kind of a situation? What can you do to reduce your anxiety? What can you do to reduce your family's anxiety? Because they are concerned about you equally. Uh, even though you know what your circumstances, they may not know what, what it is. Well, so, it's so funny you asked, Buddha, because Stacy and I were just talking about that yesterday. Yeah. How can we help you know, uh, support, whether it's parents or children or siblings, um, when we don't really have sense, a sense of control? So it, I think for me, at least, and for the clients that I'm working with, it's about looking at where we can have control. So I, I have a 23-year-old son who lives out of state, and I can't be there with him, and he's just moved from one location to another, but I could send him some food. So I found a place that was delivering food, and I did that, and I sent him some hand sanitizer. And, you know, I can do these things, you know. Um, I have elderly parents, and I can check in with them and teach them how to Zoom and then we can, you know, we can connect this way. I can't imagine what this quarantine would be like if we didn't have technology. So this is one of yeah. the beautiful gifts uh, and ways that we can connect and say, hey, I'm thinking about you. I love you. I'm concerned. Are you washing your hands? You know, that kind of thing. And what one are of your the thoughts, Jen? That, yeah, one of the things that I've shared, Buddha, is um, be careful that we're not projecting our fears onto other people. So oftentimes we think I'm so worried about this person or whatever, and they're perfectly fine. And by the way, they might be doing the same thing. I'm so worried about you there. You're perfectly fine, right? Um, and so sometimes what we think is we equate worrying with love. Mm -hmm. And we forget that that love, worrying really isn't love. Worrying is suffering, you know? There are lots of ways of loving. Yes. We can support people. We can listen to them. We can validate them. We can be present. But when we are worrying about them, really what we're doing then is that's really about us, not about them. Mm -hmm. It really isn't about them. It's about our own sense of helplessness. It's about sort of projecting our own needs on them. I want them to be here. I want them to be safe this way. I wish it was like this. But it really doesn't have a lot to do with them. And we lose sight of that. Because if we can equate it very easily to, oh, but I love them. Of course I'm worried. And I ask people to just step back and think about that for a second. You know, um, are there other ways of being able to love that are actually productive? And it is our own anxiety. Yeah, if, if, if that worry inspires something, well, then we take action and then the worry is de deplete, diminished. But if instead it's just worrying and just worrying and just worrying, then it really does invite us to take a look inside and be like, well, what are we doing? Mm -hmm. A, is it helping? And B, not is it warranted, but... Am I really, am I just assigning my own feelings of helplessness onto that person at this moment? And, and you have a 23 year old son and I have a 95 year old father-in-law who's in Florida, who mm -hmm. we just adore, who usually lives up here, but happened to have gone down to Florida. Um, he does some snowbirding, what we call it, which is traveling in the winter to someplace warmer. And lo and behold, he got stuck there. And in the beginning, I had a lot of anxiety about that. The truth is he's fine. And he's been fine. Would he rather be here? Yes. Would we rather have him here? Yes. But the truth is he can get out and walk there every day. It's warm. Here, it's still too cold and windy and wet for that. And so we are making the most of it. And we're having to get real creative about somebody helping him learn how to use Zoom so we can have Zoom calls. And 
And we're noticing what's right under these circumstances and really being present for that with each other. Um, one more question, Buddha. Do you have one more in there? Um, yeah, I was, I was actually, so this is more for me actually in this case, um, because I'm thinking, I'm always thinking about sustainability of habits, um, mm -hmm. especially when you're talking about resilience. Um, like you say, it's, 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 it's a marathon, not, not a sprint. Um, so, but, but often what ends up happening is we would come watch something like, like this webinar or read something, we'll take away something and we'll try it say for a day, day and a half, two days, and then it kind of tapers off uh, because sometimes we're taking on too much at more than maybe we are capable of. Mm -hmm. So then what would be your tips almost or recommendation when we are trying to build something which is a bit more sustainable as opposed to something that may die off more easily? It's a great question, I love it. It is, I would say baby steps for sure. So we don't want to go from, you know, I've never exercised in my life to now I'm going to train for a marathon, literally. Um, so, you know, and be a bodybuilder overnight, you know, I, I would say very small incremental steps for sure. Uh, the other thing too, is I would ask yourself, check in with yourself on a regular basis. What feels the best? Oh, you know, I tried that meditation thing. That didn't resonate with me. But what does resonate with me is playing music and dancing in my living room. And um, I love doing that, so I'm gonna do that. Or I, I, I like to sing, so I'm gonna sing songs as loud as I can, uh, despite the neighbors hearing. You know? so, so the things that you know, will stick, I think, are things that we value. And the things that don't stick may be not things that are really in our, our value system. I love that. Anything you want to add to that, Jen? Yeah, yeah, I think that one of the strategies that I've used for myself is instead of trying to incorporate everything, I choose one thing and I uh, write it with a Sharpie on my bathroom mirror, which by the way, comes off with uh, Windex a week later, but I write it so that every morning I wake up and I'm reminded of what I've committed to for that week. And the other thing that I find is really helpful is creating any kind of accountability system. So having a buddy that you say, somebody that you're gonna check in with each day. We used to call it, um, when I was a student at the University of Pennsylvania, um, uh, at the director of our program, James Pawlowski, referred to it as the uh, Aristotelian friend. So Aristotelian friends me means Aristotle, you know, somebody who is gonna hold you to your highest and best self, and you're gonna hold them to that. So when you, when you choose that person, and you say, this is what I'm committing to, on the day you forget to check in and tell them they're on you. Like, hey dude, you know, you made this commitment. Like, they're not the friend who's just gonna yes you. They're the friend who's going to know what the best version of who you are is and hold you to that instead. Mm. And so creating that buddy system, especially now in this moment of physical distance, boy, what a way for us to connect with you. What a meaningful way to connect. Hey, uh, Buddha, could you hold me accountable to this? I really want to make sure that I take Saturdays off and that is a, a day of uh, technology, a free day for me or something along those lines. And if you say, Jen, I want to make sure that I'm in bed by a certain hour, you know, that we really hold, or at least we're, you know, not on the phone at that point. We're, we're really, you know, holding each other to that out of a sense of respect and care, you know? So that buddy thing, I think, is like a superpower. It's, you know, it kind mm -hmm. of intensify our ability to be able to do something it's like telling somebody you're going on a diet <laughs> when you put it out there into the universe you know yeah. like people remember they might check in ask how you're doing yeah, yeah and i think one of the things that really helps is when we remember why we're doing it there's something called a whoop plan w-o-o-p wish outcome obstacle plan and it starts with, so what is the wish? Oh, the wish is I want to lose 10 pounds or maybe I want to work out every day or something. And then what's the outcome? And what you do is if when you get to that first, oh, you don't have a deep emotional connection to it, stays to your point of value or something that is really going to mean something to you, then the, the, the low lying barriers are going to be the thing that knock you off of it. And so if you say, well, this is my wish, I want to lose 10 pounds. And the outcome for me is because I want to feel healthy and vibrant when I play with my grandson. I want to be able to really be there for my clients. I want to be able to do something at the end of the day rather than going right to bed or sitting in front of the TV, right? Now you go to the, the second, oh, what are the obstacles? Oh, 
I, uh, it's keeping those chips on the counter. It's not getting enough sleep. And so I'm, I'm doing nighttime eating it, you know, so you identify what the obstacles are and then you create a plan for those obstacles. But if you don't have an outcome that feels compelling to you, then in some ways we are setting ourselves up for that failure. Mm -hmm. So I think to Stacy's point, make sure you know why you're doing it and that in some way it really aligns for you. You have, you, what's that Nietzsche saying, you know, if you, when you have a, a compelling why you can do any, the how doesn't matter. Like you, it's true. What is you'll it? Buddha? Figure that you, I don't, I don't know, but you'll figure the how out. That's exactly. You know, but, if you have a compelling enough why you will, you will absolutely figure out how to be able to do it. So that's really an important piece. So that brings us to 825. That's right about where we thought we would sort of close it out. We're really happy to be able to offer this to you. I hope you found some tips here that were helpful to you. Uh, Dr. Rose, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. It is my pleasure, Jennifer. Um, if it's okay with you, we're going to provide your contact information on here as well. And Absolutely. so you're welcome to contact us at the Heart Initiative if you have more questions or there are things we can do. If you have questions for Dr. Rose, we'll make sure you have some contact information and especially around relationship questions. We, we know that this is a, uh, a challenging time. It can be a blessing to be at home with people, with a family, and it can be a challenge too. And we say that and say we know it really can be a challenge to be on your own doing this. It can be a, a blessing, especially yeah. if you're an introvert and it's like, oh, finally, I don't have to be out in the world. But it, it also has its place where it can be a challenge as well. And so we're happy to help you navigate that. And let's have one final um, parting suggestion or word for people, Dr. Rose. Sure, sure. Again, thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure to be here. Um, what, really, what I would say to people is that, you know, when you talk about whether people are living alone or people are living with family, be it a spouse, be it parents, children, um, I think that there are pros and cons to all of it. There are parts that are joyful and there are parts that are difficult. And I just want to keep encouraging people to look for the micro moments of joy just these tiny little small moments of joy. Find the color on the bird that flies by and sits on a tree. Find, you know, the cobalt blue that was, you know, in the window a little while ago. It's these little micro moments of joy. If we can hold on to these, I believe we're gonna get through this. And I'm really very hopeful that we are, we not are going to get through it, we actually are getting through it. It's That's just, great. how do you wanna walk through this? So stay hopeful, everybody, stay healthy. Thank you again for having me. That, let me. Let me end with this one question for you. Um, and and uh, this is a question that I've asked a lot of people that I've interviewed. Um, I want to ask you, it, given the circumstances exactly as they are right here, right now, what do you hope for? Hmm. I hope for people to stay calm, um, to, to stay hopeful, and to your point before, Buddha, to take the lessons learned and sustain them over time to the best of their ability. It's not going to be perfect. Um, but I really, I am very much a believer that our world is shifting and changing and that so much good is going to come from this and it already has. We wouldn't be doing this had this Corona thing not happened. Um, so my hope is for people to stay hopeful and to really live more intentionally than they ever have before. Thank you. That's a beautiful ending. Thank you so much, Stacey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Buddha. Thank you. Thank you all. I, I hope you got something um, really helpful out of this. And uh, we look forward to seeing you on our next episode of Living with Heart. Until then, take care.